All right, we're going to do something a little different for this one. So I'd like to introduce Marty Kine. Marty is the SVP of product strategy for Salesforce. He's been doing that for the last four years. Probably a lot of you know him from his prior job, where he was a gardener analyst that covered this sector for many years as well. So Marty's going to give a presentation on kind of like where he's going, where Salesforce is going, um, industry trends. Then we'll do a little lightning round um, at the conclusion. Marty. All right, thank you. Aloha Trailblazers. <laughs> You're supposed to say Aloha Ranger Marty. Okay. Aloha Trailblazers. Aloha. Yeah, thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, <laughs> I'm Marty Kine, I work at Salesforce. So I'm going to go through the past, present, and future of marketing and ads in 12 minutes. You're welcome. By the way, the most interesting thing about me <laughs> is still that when I was at a company called Booze, where actually one of the partners is sitting right here, <laughs> I wrote a book, a memoir called House of Lies that was turned into a show on Showtime. This is a true story, and there's a character named Marty Khan who's loosely, 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 loosely based on me. So speaking of ancient history, <laughs> what was the first commercial browser? Anybody? It's right on the screen. Netscape. Yeah, well, the first widely adopted commercial browser, Netscape. So it was, it was created by a bunch of engineers from the University of Illinois, including Mark Andreessen, who apparently is around here somewhere. And um, on the home page, as you can see there, was something called the Amazing Fish Cam. The Fish Cam was one of the first live-ish cams. And it was pointed at an aquarium on the desk of this fellow. Lou Montulli, who was an engineer from the University of Kansas, not the University of Illinois, so he was a bit of an outlier. And Lou is famous, sort of famous these days, uh, for inventing the cookie. <laughs> he has a sense of humor you can see on the right there. He has a jar of cookies. Now, Lou was not thinking of advertising at all. I've talked to Lou. I feel I can call him Lou. He's actually a very nice fellow. And he is not that old. He's in his 50s, which tells you how young the internet is. But at any rate, um, Lou said he was thinking about a shopping cart. The way the internet was designed, it has permanent amnesia, so there's no state. So you need to maintain state in the browser, and that's what the cookie's for. But pretty quickly, 1995, Netscape was founded. 1995, DoubleClick was founded, and a bunch of companies in the space that we would call ad serving and ad networks, although that's not what they called themselves. DoubleClick formed a profile around individuals based on their browsing behavior. They had a lot of the large publishers in their network, so they had a, you know, not a complete profile, but a pretty good profile. There was another company who was one of their competitors at the time who took a principled stance against the use of third-party cookies. They felt it was an invasion of privacy. Does anyone remember this company? It was, of course, WebConnect. <laughs> they were on the wrong side of history. Perhaps not the best business decision. Now, DoubleClick did a lot of innovation. They were actually a really excellent company for a run there in the 90s, and they invented retargeting. Many people in this room probably think they invented retargeting. You did not. My researchers have told me DoubleClick actually invented retargeting. It was called the boom list, the boomerang tag. Those of you may remember it. And uh, they didn't make a lot of money off it in the beginning, but it worked really, really well. Retargeting is the killer app of display. It worked. It, when I used to do measurement, retargeted ads work three times better, 300% better than like a regularly well-targeted ad. The trouble with retargeting is it's extremely noticeable. <laughs> if you are a consumer and you are looking at a pair of shoes on a retail site and then you go to CNN.com and you see an ad with the same exact pair of shoes with the same color, you don't have to be all that astute to realize something is going on. So retargeting raised the... Um, awareness of ad tech, but not in a good way, I would say. So sure enough, if you look at organic search trends for tracking, they've gone up and up and up ever since the invention of retargeting. And uh, this is not a fad. How do I know it's not a fad? Let's compare it to a real fad. Bieber. Bieber <laughs> has fallen off a cliff. None of you are searching for Bieber anymore. And just for interest, I looked at um, cookies. Cookies, uh, it, they actually, people are not searching for cookie information anymore, which tells me two things. One is that um, most people are not in advertising and really don't care. And the second thing is that sometime around December 24th, everyone forgets how to bake. You can see this one. <laughs> then we had Zuckerberg, 2018. 
So this was after Cambridge Analytica and the 2016 elections, and Zuckerberg appeared in front of the Senate. Now, these were elderly senators asking incredibly inane questions, those of you who might have seen it. Apparently, 80 million people saw at least part of these hearings, so they were very widely covered. Nothing happened. There was no legislation, big surprise. But it did have an unintended consequence. People became very worried about their phones. We did not trust our phones anymore. Now, what do I mean by that? Most people access Facebook on their smartphone, and all of a sudden they realize something they should have known already, which is that someone was paying attention to what they were doing on their phone. It almost forced Apple to do what it did later. By no coincidence, 2018 is exactly the same time when digital beat offline. <laughs> digital won. I never thought that would happen. Television was so dominant. I mean, does anyone remember 2005? Digital was like 10% of your media plan. And, and we won. I mean, there's no, way to, no other way to say it. The other thing is that it became a much more mature and, and consolidated industry. The three big players is this idea of the rule of the three, NBC, CBS, uh, CBS and ABC in the 70s. Now we have Meta, we have um, uh, 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 Alphabet, and we have Amazon. So maybe it's natural, I don't know. But there are three big players, and it's, so it's um, concentrated on the digital side. There is another player, of course, who is Apple. Now, Apple's arguably more disruptive than these other ones, and Apple has taken a privacy's first stance. They've leapt into the void left by government and appointed themselves the neighborhood watch for the World Wide Web. So I call your attention to this. This is the front line in the battle for the soul of modern marketing which is the opt-in screen. This box is very sad when you think about it. This is what we've come to. This is required language. Now, I call your attention to this, permission to track you. Tracking is not a benefit. No rational actor would opt in to this statement, would they? And most people don't. Well, I do, because I like to see how ads are targeted. But as has been said earlier in this conference, you know, compare this to the way Apple describes you know, opting into their own experience. And you can see there's a lot more words. There's an emphasis on personalization. And they actually say they don't track you. How can they get away with that? It's the tyranny of first party data. There's also something known as the privacy paradox, which is an academic discipline. You can search for it. There are papers written on it. I've read some of them. There's one paper that claims it doesn't exist. There's always one. But there are 34 that say this is real. And the basic idea here is that you cannot, we as consumers, cannot make a logical decision, an informed decision, about whether to opt in or out of an experience that we haven't had yet. You know, how do I know if I'm opting into personalization when I have no idea what personalization is? I have to decide early I don't have enough information. The only way around it is to do what Apple did, which is basically build a brand where everybody, you know, we are trust. Trust us, so I don't even have to think, oh, I trust them. You know, there are some brands like that. And the other thing is keep it positive. Keep it positive. Uh, the, <laughs> this is sort of a funny experiment, but um, what about the states? Okay, we all have to conform to the most stringent state regulation. So in the US, we have 50 states, they're all different, and Oregon is probably crazy. Maybe they're gonna outlaw behavioral advertising. It's not impossible, it could happen. So what if they do that? The experience is not pretty. I have done this. Actually, go on your MacBook. You can do this yourself. Disable all your cookies and obscure your IP address and then surf the web and see what kind of ads you get. You will be shocked at what a jarring experience that is. We have been spoiled by relevance over the years. We really have. Consumers have no idea how bad it's going to be when there's no targeting. <laughs> it's, um, it's the late night cable experience. So two or three in the morning, <laughs> can't sleep, going through cable, random channels. You see ads for two things, food. Why? Because you're a human being and human beings eat. That's as good as the targeting gets. And the other thing is class action lawsuits. Now, why do you get class action lawsuits? Because if they show a, a million ads and they get one hit, they've paid for the campaign. So that's how that works. Where are we going? Où allons-nous? It's always good to work on our French. <laughs> it is. It's good to work on your French. So two things. You need, marketers need the ability to target. That's accessibility or addressability, and then accessibility also, and then accountability, which is measure. Target and measure. We're very simple people. 
Uh, when you're building a media plan, a campaign, if you're doing it right, you always start spending your money, right, don't you, closer to the point of purchase, so closer to the point of conversion, down the funnel, and then build up from there, up to brand. And then the other thing is you use channels that you can control more. So those, you know, that's why search does so well. Which brings us to this. What is this? A walled garden. <laughs> this is an actual walled garden. So many of you talk about walled garden. This is a real, real walled garden. I thought I would show you one. They're big in England. <laughs> they talked about hedge gardens earlier. I think that might be a hedge around the garden. But. So I know some of, some of you are in here, so let's just call them gardens. That's better. So they're gardens. And uh, this is a phenomenon much discussed today, retail media. This should have been predictable. But anyone who is sitting on a pool of first party data that's authenticated, that people have opted into, that is cleanish, you know, and that is available for targeting is sitting on a, you know, a gold mine. The question, how do you monetize the gold mine? It's a gold mine, nonetheless. And uh, the other thing is around measurement. This is uh, reporting that you can get from Amazon. Now, I call this the illusion of ultimate measurement. They are doing view through attribution here. Our friend MarketShare is here. So view through attribution is what we wanted to do in the open web. Somebody saw an ad, two weeks later they convert. Well, I can just go to Amazon and they show me. Two, you know, two weeks earlier, someone saw the ad and then they converted. We don't know that that ad drove that conversion. I have a feeling two weeks later, it probably didn't. But the implication here is it did. So the implication for less sophisticated marketers is put all your money into this one platform because you'll have great attribution. It's powerful. You know, it's, 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 it really is <laughs> it's helping Amazon. There was actually a slide on that earlier. The other thing, these are extremely uncontroversial pr um, predictions that I'm making here. Number two is about influencers. So this is what I call the rise of non-ad ad formats. What do I mean by that? Well, search is kind of like a non-ad ad format. You know, think about what I put in the search box and the searches that come up. It's extremely targeted to me, and it's very personal. But it doesn't feel like an ad. I don't feel like my privacy, and neither do regulators. They're not looking at search. Um, influences is the same. If Taylor Swift tells me she likes Diet Coke, which she has told me that through her channel, <laughs> I have no reason to disbelieve her. You know, maybe she, I know she's getting paid to say that. In fact, if she's ethical, she's telling me she's getting paid. But I still have no reason to think she doesn't like Diet Coke. It doesn't feel like an ad. The other thing is product placement. Now, I happen to know of some stealth startups starting in this space. As AI gets better, generative um, content, the, the melding of these products into content is going to be amazing. It'll be blowing. We, have, we just started here. This hasn't, it hasn't really got, I mean, it's a big business, but it's not big enough. Now, you see what I did there? I did product placement. I wrote that book. <laughs> I co-wrote it. <laughs> it is the best-selling book on customer data platforms <laughs> in the entire world, I think. It's, <laughs> it's the only book on customer data platforms. <laughs> and it just came out in Japanese. All right, so I'll sum all this up. I'll sum all this up, and then we could do our lightning round. <laughs> Uh, so where are we today? This is the world of today. So we have ad tech on the top, massive scale, and then we have our Salesforce world on the bottom, CRM, CDP, PII, and they're stitched together. If you're wondering about the difference between proxy data and personal data, this is my cat Jerry. On the right is personal PII Jerry, and on the left would be proxy Jerry. There's no reason to have that in there. I just think he's really a cute cat. <laughs> And so over time, what happened is you know, the, the identifiers on the top are fading away slowly over time. And the center of gravity has shifted downward, as we all know. And it shifted into this world of the unified profile. And that brings us to what Salesforce is working on. We are all in this space about managing your customer identity. And I will now ask my friend Brian to come up, and we'll do a Q&A. Thank you. We got, we, got? we got to we have Martech. three minutes and three minutes and nine seconds. So we can cover it. All right. So I was I was waiting for that. And I'm like, okay, we've gone through Netscape, DoubleClick, Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, Amazon. Um, okay, we got to, to Salesforce. So I saw the announcement, like other people probably saw this, where you at Salesforce um, at Dreamforce announced Salesforce Genie. Yes. That is described as the platform for customer magic. <laughs> So what, what, what's what, the question? What, what is this? That's what is, it is. Is that what it is? 
Jeannie, yeah, it was announced. Uh, Mark Benioff and uh, Brett Taylor, our co-CEOs, went on, got on stage with the bunny ears. So they, they were you know, bringing the, the genie out of the bottle. The, <laughs> they were dreaming of genie at Dreamforce. And basically what genie is, we have CDP. So CD, the, the way um, Salesforce works, 20 years ago, Salesforce was founded. Salesforce Automation, so it's CRM. Then there's Service Cloud. Service Cloud was built on Sales Cloud, as you know. So it's B2B, it's for the call center. And then Marketing Cloud came along. Marketing Cloud, as you all know, is a series of acquisitions. We acquired Exact Target, B2C. It was, it was a, you know, a controversial acquisition in a different space. And then there was Datarama, there was Crux, there was you know, Buddy Media, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. CDP is a, a product that's demanded by the marketing buyer. So you know, for the most part, until recently, it's been marketing buyers. And so it fit nicely within Marketing Cloud. We decided not to do an acquisition. We built it ourselves. So Salesforce built the CDP on top of the same basic code base as Sales Cloud, Service Cloud. So it's the first part of Marketing Cloud that's first a native product, a Salesforce native product, not an acquisition. And it fits in very well with the rest of the platform. So, so is that's Genie, the background. Is Genie the CDP? Or? So in order to build CDP, we had to build composable services, AKA microservices, uh -huh and bundle them together into a product we called CDP. It was then realized, and this was the master plan, that those services could be made available throughout Salesforce in the call center. And what do I mean, like as an example, identity management. We, we can do identity stitching, it's deterministic, it's probabilistic, all the rules. We were talking earlier about how complicated that is. That's a set of microservices that were built for CDP. Genie takes them and unbundles them and makes them potentially available to other products. So it sounds so like we've talked magic. about the uh, you know, <laughs> composable CDP. Um, sounds like yours was built, maybe not by accident, but uh, yeah. it was built in that fashion. Yeah, and that's how apparently you know, modern software development happens that way. It's, everything's built in little microservices. And, and so the other thing I would say is that uh, Marketing Cloud is only 20% of Salesforce revenue. It's, you know, it's mostly on the CRM side. So it's Sales Cloud and, and Commerce Cloud also. And so the vision for our, what we reluctantly called the CDP, it was always enterprise-wide. It was serve business transformation, help marketing work with this, the call center, because we have a lot of call center customers, help marketing work with commerce, because we have a lot of commerce customers. So it's not a marketing-focused um, product. All right, truly lightning run. round. We are out. So we are now in the home run. Marty, thanks so much. Thank really you. Enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs>